On the 16th of December 1914, the German Imperial Navy attacked the British seaside towns of Scarborough, Hartlepool and Whitby. The German High Seas Fleet, which was numerically smaller than the British Grand Fleet, had been ordered to avoid direct engagement with the enemy. Instead, they focused on targeted attacks to draw out smaller portions of the Royal Navy that could be confronted by U-boats. After a successful raid on the seaside town of Yarmouth, the use of such tactics was increased. The German leadership had determined that an attack on Scarborough, Hartlepool and Whitby would be possible after a U-17 returned from a reconnaissance mission. It found that there were very few mines in the vicinity, and no coastal defences, which made the towns an especially easy target since they were within a comfortable distance of Germany. British intelligence officers had already decoded messages that indicated the German fleet would be mounting the raid. However, British Admiral John Jellicoe opted to allow the raid to happen and then intercept the German ships on their return. This decision proved catastrophic, as the British underestimated the size of the German attack. Over a thousand shells were fired, resulting in 137 deaths 
and a further 592 people being injured. Most of the casualties were civilians, and to make matters worse, the British fleet failed to engage the enemy on their return. The British public was outraged firstly that the Germans had attacked civilians, and secondly that the Royal Navy had failed to stop them. Remember Scarborough soon became a key message of the British propaganda campaign, and revenge was used as an incentive for recruitment to the armed forces.
In the winter of 1914, the war seemed a world away from Scarborough. True, the outbreak of hostilities on the eve of August bank holiday had ruined the promising holiday season. All rail excursions had been cancelled. Unofficial rationing was in force. Some of the younger men had gone off to France. But few could really see how the murder of an obscure Austrian archduke could affect their lives. Scarborough looked and felt at peace. I stooped down to get a ladle of meal to give to the chickens and the ground seemed to lift to meet me and with that of course I just stood up and looked straight out to sea. I saw a battle cruiser, two funnels, steaming towards Scarborough and a terrific flash gun flash again from in front of this ship and this ship and then I see a third ship coming in, into view and they were all firing broadside after broadside gun flash after gun flash it was when we got up in the morning we had our, just had our breakfast and there was a terrific amount of banging awful noise we couldn't make out what it was with the railway being at the back of us and the goods depot we thought it was that and Mother was ill at the time in bed, and she called down to us to ask what the noise was. And we said, well, we didn't know. So she got out of bed, looked out of the window, and saw a shell explode over the goods depot. So she immediately put her coat on and came downstairs to us. And we were really absolutely terrified. We didn't know what to think. Two German cruisers, the Derflinger and the Von der Tann, had slunk into the South Bay here and begun shelling the town. That bombardment was to last just 35 minutes, but it was to wreak a terrible toll of death and destruction on Scarborough. The two battle cruisers and an accompanying light cruiser, the Kolberg, were part of a larger force under Rear Admiral von Hipper. Leaving the German coast at dusk, the force, four battle cruisers, two cruisers, and two destroyer flotillas, rendezvoused off Heligoland. Warned by intercepted signals, British warships under Admirals Warrender and Beatty had been sent to head off the German force at the Dogger Bank. But the engagement, fought before first light in a swirling mist, was inconclusive. The ships of both sides blundered about in the dark, unsure of who they were firing at, and British and German losses were both light. With visibility getting worse, the Germans slipped through. Three ships, the Seidlitz, the Moltke and the Blücher, shelled Hartlepool. Ninety-five people were killed, over 400 injured. More than 300 buildings were damaged or destroyed. Further south, the Derflinger, the Von der Tann, and the Kolberg struck at Scarborough. The people of Scarborough were quite unprepared for the bombardment that followed. Some thought the noise came from Royal Naval ships at gunnery practice. Others thought there was a thunderstorm. So nobody bothered to take cover. And until the shells actually began to explode in the town, everybody just carried on with the normal course of business. And we went out into the streets because there were these big bangs going. And then went up the street, some women were arguing it were about, let's see. Then there were another big bang, and then there were no more. I was in hospital. Alfred Beale, a postman, was on his rounds in Filey Road when the bombardment began. At a house called Donnelly, he was handing a letter to a maid when a shell exploded, killing both of them instantly. Sixteen shells hit the house, destroying the library. This book, salvaged from the ruins of the room, has been preserved. A shell splinter is still lodged in it. A milkman on his rounds had just left his horse and cart to take some milk to a house when he turned, just in time to see a shell explode, killing the horse, damaging the cart. Both he and the milk were totally unharmed. People were coming away from the centre of the town. I think they rather panicked. Instead of running, staying there where they were safe, they were running into danger. One lady was running up the street here, in a, just dressed in a nightdress, and my mother went out and brought her in and asked her to stay, but she wouldn't. And so we gave her clothing, a long black skirt and a shawl, and she went away up into the street, and that was the last we saw of her.
The Grand Hotel, with its imposing position on the seafront, was an easy target for the German gunners. 36 shells hit the hotel and the restaurant. The cost of the damage was estimated at more than £13,000. Fortunately, the summer season was long gone and Christmas was still a week away, so there were, in fact, only two people staying in that huge hotel at the time. Even so, there were some quite amazing escapes. A shell burst in a waiter's room only minutes after he'd left it. In another room, the only thing left standing was the head of the bedstead. Nearby, another of Scarborough's famous hotels, the Royal, was also damaged. The shell which hit it is believed to have first struck the municipal buildings across the road. The official German account of the raid described Scarborough as a fortified town. But its only visible defences were the ruins of the famous castle, built to withstand medieval armies, not modern guns. The castle walls, ten feet thick, were hit in several places by shells. The castle itself was damaged, and the old barracks on Castle Hill, at that time unoccupied and used as a store, were virtually destroyed. Despite the intensity of the bombardment, the number of casualties was relatively small. In one sense, Scarborough was very lucky. If the shelling had come half an hour later, there'd have been lots more people on the way to work, the number of casualties would have been that much greater. The timing of the raid prevented a disaster at Gladstone Road School, which was hit by several shells. One went through the roof into the school hall, where half an hour later, hundreds of children were due to assemble. One of them was Mrs. Wood. The classroom where I would have been, had I been at school, received a direct hit. And I think had the bombardment come later, there are a great many people who are living today who wouldn't have been there at all, because we should certainly have been in the remnants of the school. Further up Gladstone Road, at number 55, there was another remarkable escape. A single shell wrecked two bedrooms, but the six people in the house all escaped without injury. As one man ran out, his jacket was caught by a flying shell. It tore his sleeve in three places, but he was unhurt. I couldn't make you believe how terrified we were because, I mean, I was only 12 years old, but I was really an old 12 in one way, you see, because I had to mother the others. And, uh, and she, and, uh, I, we only heard them talking, they said afterward, that. Like, we all just thought it was an invasion, you see, that day, because we never thought that could happen to us, you see. In the confusion which reigned, rumours spread quickly. Many feared the bombardment was the springboard for a German invasion. For some time after the shelling had ceased, roads inland were thronged with motor vehicles and horse carts. Scarborough Station was reportedly crowded with people clutching their belongings, some still in their nightclothes. They packed the trains to Hull, to York, to Leeds, to anywhere to get away from danger. My father was an engine driver. He was at work at the time. And of course, he was worried about us. So he came home to find if we were still all right. And uh, his first thought was to get us away. And we hastily packed a bag and went to the station. There were lots of people all with the same intention there. I don't know whether they all caught the train to Pickering or not, but the, the feeling I had was that people wanted to get away from Scarborough in case the Germans had landed. So this Mr Harper sent word to say we could all go on his lorry, which was a light lorry, and uh, where well, she just shut the house and left it. One shell hit a house in Wycombe Street. Seven people lived there. Mr and Mrs Bennett, their two sons, two young children, and an old lady lodger. Mrs Bennett, one son, and the two children were killed. The father and the other son were seriously injured. The old lady escaped unhurt. In Commercial Street, about a mile inland, an 80-year-old woman and a badly injured daughter were found huddled in the ruins of their home, seven hours after the bombardment had ended. The saddest story of all is that of Sergeant Sturdy, a regular soldier from Scarborough. He hadn't seen his fiancée, Ada Crow, for eight and a half years. Then he sent a telegram saying he was coming home on leave. The couple planned to marry. He arrived home on the Wednesday night to find that Ada Crow had been killed in that morning's shelling. What was to have been the wedding day turned out to be the funeral day. And then suddenly it was all over. The shells stopped. People came out of their houses. There was bricks and mortar and debris all over the road. And the house at the end of the street had been hit. We went down there to see it. 
Father told Tom to get the Sunbeam card out and we drove into Scarborough. And of course, when we got to Scarborough, we did see the damage. Nearly everywhere you went, holes in houses, sides knocked out, holes underneath walls, everywhere. All through the day, casualties were brought into Scarborough Hospital. The hospital building itself was struck by a shell, but doctors and nurses worked on. Eyewitnesses said those with minor injuries willingly made way for the seriously ill. One woman who'd undergone an operation six days before left her bed to make way for the injured. The bombardment ended at 8.30, the last shot hitting the lighthouse on Vincent's Pier. It was damaged so seriously that it had to be demolished, to be rebuilt only after the war. The three ships then turned and steamed northward to Whitby. Again, the town's inhabitants were taken by surprise, and few took cover. A coast guard was decapitated by a shell as he stood outside his house, one of the three people to die in Whitby. The bombardment lasted 11 minutes. In that time, over 150 shells fell on the town. One shell struck the famous abbey, destroying the arch of the west doorway and the masonry above it. The abbey lodge was damaged, and houses and schools in the Meadowfield Park and Fishburn Park districts were also hit. No one in Scarborough knew the raid was over. No one knew that German troops wouldn't follow the ships. So while the local cavalry detachment galloped onto the beach to reassure the populace, the British government hastily dispatched more troops to the area. Rifleman William Reynard of the 8th West Yorkshire Regiment was on manoeuvres near York when a motorcyclist rode up with orders for his commanding officer. The battalion about turned, marched back to York and then trained for Scarborough. Half of us went down and dug these trenches against the Grand Hotel, and the other half stopped in, uh, in the station to clear the station up. Before dawn, it must have been sometime about five o'clock in the morning, we went in, uh, into these trenches that we dug for anything that happened, if anything were likely to happen, which it was. What we could do to uh, a gunboat with the uh, <laughs> point three or three rifles, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, that's all we had, there were no artillery about. After all that, we marched round uh, Scarborough, right on the Marine Drive, and we could see uh, Dutch shells, several Dutch, Dutch shells in the Castle Hill. And when we marched all round Scarborough, and uh, right round, it must have been about altogether a four-mile march, you see. We, we marched in fighting order with rifles, you see, and, and uh, that was to let the people see that we had something to fire with, so <laughs> that they wouldn't do any harm on the rifles, only to kill a man. Nineteen people died in the bombardment of Scarborough, and 80 were injured. More than 200 buildings were damaged or destroyed. While the timing of the raid may have reduced the number of deaths and injuries, the confusion which followed the first explosions could have increased the casualty figures. Some eyewitnesses say that when the first wave of shells fell on the seafront, people rushed up into the town and were caught by a second bombardment falling further inland. And the Germans also left a deadly legacy here in Scarborough because the cruisers had dropped mines out here in the harbour. In the months to come, there were tragedies as fishing vessels under the vessels struck those mines. The worst tragedy was on Christmas Day, just nine days after the shelling. A minesweeper struck a mine just six miles offshore. Six men were killed. There are many unanswered questions about the raid. Perhaps the main one is why the Germans chose to bombard the three ports at all. Scarborough wasn't a military target, and the loss of life, the injuries, tragic though they were, were insignificant compared with the vast number of casualties in other war theatres. The most likely explanation is that the Germans thought the raid would have a propaganda value out of all proportion to either the damage done or the casualties inflicted. Britain was still regarded as the strongest naval power in the world. The shelling of the three ports was the first time in more than a hundred years that a British town had suffered a naval bombardment. German newspapers greeted the raid as a major victory. Even the press of the United States, which was still neutral in the conflict, didn't outwardly condemn the bombardment. They argued that it exposed serious weaknesses in Britain's naval defences.
More than 500 shells fell on Scarborough in that day. In fact, some estimates put the figure as high as 700. This is one that didn't explode. It's six inches in diameter, it weighs 80 pounds, and it didn't go off because its fuse fell out on impact. It was found in front of St Mary's Hospital. But in Britain, the banner headlines of papers like the Scarborough Pictorial evoked an angry response throughout the country. Winston Churchill spoke of the baby killers. Such cruel and senseless operations, said one observer, could have been ordered only by the leaders of a nation which had temporarily gone mad. But the rhetoric of both sides was lost on the people of Scarborough. Within days of the bombardment, they were busily repairing the damage and getting on with their work. The Times special correspondent dispatched north to survey the damage was impressed by the resilience of the town's inhabitants. A stranger, he wrote, would have nothing but the broken buildings to tell him that this quiet seaside resort had been subjected to an experience virtually unknown to an English town. Both the Von der Tann and the Derflinger were damaged at the Battle of Jutland in 1916, and they were scuttled when the German fleet surrendered at Scarpa Flow. A brass plaque from the Derflinger has, ironically, found its way back to Scarborough in the possession of a man who was in the Orkneys in the early 1940s, when the German ships were being salvaged. The bombardment of the three towns was one of the first incidents of what came to be known as total war. War fought not between professional armies on foreign soil, but between nations and peoples. And the propaganda wasn't just on the German side. The memory of that raid was exploited in posters urging men to enlist. Remember Scarborough became the watchword of the recruiting officers. Scarborough served to harden the war spirit. And on the people who lived there, the raid left an indelible impression. We look through the window. There's nothing to see. Not one glimmer of any sort, just one black patch. No chimneys or anything to be seen. And I said to myself then, well, Scarborough has at last woke up. She was at war.
December 1914, and on the North Sea at least, World War I was off to a slow start. 
The powerful German high seas fleet, confident that they could deliver a quick and fatal blow to the Royal Navy, had encountered a slight problem. Fearful that the Germans' confidence of a quick and decisive victory might not be so misplaced, the British Admiralty had ordered the fleet to be secured in the protected harbour of Scapa Flow. The German response was simple, to cause such an outrage amongst the British public that to avoid damaging civilian morale, the First Lord of the British Admiralty, Winston Churchill, would have no choice but to send the fleet out to exact revenge at sea. To this end, it was decided to bombard civilian targets on the northeast coast of England, namely Whitby, Scarborough and Hartlepool. And so, at 8am on the 16th of December, three ominous shapes emerged from the grey mists off the coast of Hartlepool headland. At first mistaken for British ships, they were in fact the devastating German battlecruisers Seidlitz and Moltke, and the older, less capable armoured cruiser, the Blucher. Gliding into position opposite the defensive Yuff battery, on the order of Task Force Commander Admiral Hipper, the heavy German guns began to spit fire and destruction. <laughs> German gunners were good. Their very first shot, intended simply to find the range of the target, actually struck Yuff Battery dead on, killing a young sentry from the Durham Light Infantry who were garrisoned nearby. This plaque marks the spot where Private Theophilus Jones fell dead, the first soldier to die in action on British soil since the English Civil War some two centuries before. proved to be no fluke shot either, as the second shell fell directly on top of the first, killing two medics who had run out to check on Private Jones. Sadly, they were only the first of many casualties claimed by the engagement. The gunners of the Yuff battery quickly responded in kind, and even though heavily outgunned, caused such damage to the German attackers that the scheduled hour-long bombardment was cut short by a full 20 minutes. At the same time, the nearby garrison of DLI deployed along Spy and Kopp to the north of the Yuff, in order to repulse any attempt the Germans may have made to land troops on the broad north sands beneath. During the engagement, the German vessels managed to fire off 1,150 shells. Although aimed at the batteries, many actually exploded within the town itself. The morning mist had forced the ships close to the shore, causing their shells to bounce off the concrete apron before they could arm, only to be fully ready to detonate once they came back down in the populated areas beyond. <laughs> The damage to Hartlepool was extensive and the cost in lives high. Over 100 died in the raid and scores more were injured. Some of the relics of this devastation are displayed in the Museum of Hartlepool alongside a broader recounting of the story. After the war a monument was erected, winged victory, on the location of the first civilian casualty. Escaping into the mists, the German task force had indeed achieved its primary goal. The British public was infuriated and the Admiralty had no choice but to dispatch the Royal Navy to seek retribution. However, contrary to the other part of the German plan, it was the Royal Navy who actually had the last laugh. In the famous battles that followed at Doggerbank and Jutland, they inflicted severe damage on the German high seas fleet, reducing their effectiveness for the remainder of the war. For a grieving Hartlepool, however, it was a cold consolation. The raid on Scarborough, 
Hartlepool, and Whitby on 16 December 1914 was an attack by the Imperial German Navy on the British ports of Scarborough, Hartlepool, West Hartlepool and Whitby. The bombardments caused hundreds of civilian casualties and resulted in public outrage in Britain against the German Navy for the raid and the Royal Navy for failing to prevent it. The German high seas fleet had been seeking opportunities to isolate small sections of the Grand Fleet to cut off trap and destroy. A raid on Yarmouth had produced few results but demonstrated the potential for fast raiding into British waters. On 16 November, Rear Admiral Franz von Hipper, commander of the German battlecruiser squadron, persuaded his superior, Admiral Friedrich von Ingenel, to ask the Kaiser for permission to conduct another raid. The U-boat U-17 was sent to reconnoiter coastal defenses near Scarborough and Hartlepool. The captain reported little onshore defense, no mines within 12 miles of the shore, and a steady stream of shipping. It was also believed that two British battlecruisers, which would be the fast ships sent out first to investigate any attack, had been dispatched to South America and had taken part in the Battle of the Falkland Islands.